Welcome everyone. I am Mireya Solis, Director of the Center for East Asia Policy Studies at the Brookings Institution. Thank you very much for joining us for today's public webinar, Vulnerability and Resilience, the Future of East Asian Supply Chains. Global supply chains have been central to East Asia's economic rise. Trade and investment liberalization and moderate interstate competition allowed extended production networks to develop across national borders, resulting in growing levels of regional and extra-regional integration. These production networks have thrived. Keep in mind that more than two thirds of world trade today occurs through global value chains and East Asian economies have been front and center in these developments, giving rise to what we now commonly refer to as factory Asia. Just to give you an example, East Asia leads the world in the share of supply chain trade, that is trading components in machinery, in technology, services in the electronic sector, according to a recent study of the United States International Trade Commission. Well, this uh, supply chain model of economic growth has long dealt with localized political risk and on occasion natural disasters, we may be seeing a shift to a broader, more sustained set of risks brought on by great power competition, pandemic disruption and economic nationalism. As the geopolitical landscape has changed, so have the sources of vulnerability and resilience for these production networks, opening questions about the future of this essential driver of economic growth for the region. To discuss this critical moment for East Asia supply chains, we have with us uh, today a panel of distinguished experts. We will discuss how great power competition supply shocks and the pandemic have affected East Asia supply chains, as well as challenges faced and strategies implemented by Japanese and Taiwanese production networks in mitigating risks brought on by these factors. I will introduce today's panelists in the order in which they will offer their initial remarks. First, Dr. Etil, Etil Solingen, is Distinguished Professor and the Tierney Chair in Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of California, Irvine. She is the editor of her forthcoming book on geopolitics, supply chains, and the international relations of East Asia. Next is Dr. Tian Ji Chen, who is a Professor Emeritus of the National Taiwan University. Professor Chen previously served as the Minister of the Council for Economic Planning and Development and the National Development Council in Taiwan. Among his many books, he is a chief author of Taiwanese Firms in Southeast Asia, Networking Across Borders. And last but not least, Dr. Christine Vacassi is Associate Professor in the Department of Political Science and School of Policy and International Affairs at the University of Maine. She's the author of the book, Risk Management Strategies of Japanese Companies in China. Following initial presentations from each of the panelists, we will hold a moderated discussion and then a Q&A session with our virtual audience. I would like to remind our viewers to submit their questions by email to events at brookings.edu or by Twitter using hashtag supply chains. So now I would like to turn the floor over to Professor Solingen for her remarks. Ethel, uh, please go ahead. I think you're in mute. Thank you, Mireya. Much appreciate. Let me see if I can share my screen successfully. Uh, is that visible? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my focus on uh, GVCs came out. Uh, so you see the number one slide, right? Yes? Okay. Uh, my focus on GVCs came out of wrestling with an article I published in International Security, the journal at the Belfort Center in 2014 on the centenary of World War I. And that piece argued in a nutshell that 2014 was not 1914, that China was not necessarily the new Kaiser Reich, and that GVCs had much to do with all that. 
I worked on the interaction between GVCs and security since, but my remarks today address a, a small subset of that broader agenda, uh, sharing some findings from a collaborative volume that is posted on this slide, and that will be available this week or next week from Cambridge University Press. I'd like to thank uh, the University of California Office of the President for funding this project at a time when GVCs or global supply chains were well below the radar. Events since 2018 provide some form of natural experiment for gauging the role of GVCs in the international relations of the Asia Pacific, because the pre-existing GVC infrastructure has been under stress and interstate tensions, as Mireya uh, remarked, have escalated beyond anything we've seen in recent decades. Events are still unfolding though, so what we have is a very pre preliminary snapshot. Uh, we're moving to a slide on the general background, which includes the fact that the inward looking turn in China and the US targeted GVCs well before COVID, but the pandemic exacerbated geopolitical tensions dramatically and raised public awareness of GVC interdependence. Uh, criticism of efficient, just-in-time, lean inventories via GVCs became widespread along with calls for decoupling, reshoring, self-sufficiency, self-reliance, etc. A pushback against these calls recommended enhancing redundancies and diversification as a better way to increase resilience and security of supply than decoupling or reshoring. Now, firm level surveys suggest that reshoring has hardly been the standard GVC response thus far. Uh, for one, it's too expensive. GVCs have instead adapted by diversifying production and sourcing, some relaxation of just-in-time production, more robust inventories, mapping all the tiers and sub-tiers, more transparency, regionalization, near-shoring, shorter supply chains, and especially automation and digitalization. The next slide has a little bit more detail so reg <coughs> excuse me, regarding firm strategies, according to a Gartner probe, 87% of firms are investing in increasing resilience over the next two years, 66% in enhancing supply chain visibility or transparency and mapping. Most firms retained an in China for China strategy with 80% having no plans to relocate production or sourcing outside China in 2018, rising to 85% in late 2020, so fewer than in 2018. Developing Asia captured about 60% of favored destinations in 2019, declining actually to about 40% in 2020. Japanese, South Korean, Taiwanese, and even Chinese firms continued the flight from China's rising labor costs over the recent years, relocating some production and final assembly to Southeast Asia, especially Vietnam, but also Mexico, India, etc. US-China tensions were the most important reason for considering relocation for about 66% of firms in 2020 followed by you know, general uncertainty in the policy environment and risk management. I want to focus now uh, more directly on the geopolitical dimension um, for these firms. So 66% deemed US-China decoupling to be impossible in 2019. Only 45% found decoupling impossible by March 2020. And this is the beginning of the pandemic. In late 2020, for the first time, rising US-China tensions became the number one challenge for 78% of firms across all industrial categories and services. About 50% were pessimistic regarding US-China relations and only about 15% were optimistic 
rising to 35% uh, optimism in another survey. But in late 2020, 92% of US companies projected a quite likely or very likely escalation in US trade, uh, US China trade disputes over the next three years. However, prior to the 2020 elections, 34% foresaw a deterioration in US-China relations, whereas after the elections, only 11% predicted further deterioration. Uh, prior to the 2020 elections, only 35% believed relations would improve, and after the elections, 50% predicted improvement. So things um, became slightly better towards the end of 2020. Let me quickly move to some conclusions. Surveys then suggest a potential decline in China's status as factory of the world relative to the past, but hardly its demise. Diversification implies a China plus one or China plus many strategy where China's domestic market remains, of course, a powerful source of attraction, but other, uh, adding other countries softens this extreme dependence on China. A, a revised rather than obsolescing GVC infrastructure may be emerging, possibly, just possibly one more resilient, but resilient, resilience is not necessarily self-sufficiency. However, uh, weaponization and coercive statecrafts, uh, coercive statecraft are two-way streets. Dual circulation policies and no executive orders continue to fuel uncertainty. So there is a non-trivial likelihood that geopolitics, tech competition, and the legacy of uh, COVID-19 could unleash even more sizable disruptions in the global geography of production. Now, there is much, much more in the book with contributions from excellent economists and political scientists to topics such as global supply chains and technology, labor, trade balances, US domestic politics, China domestic politics, the evolving smart phone industry, and of course, artificial intelligence, all as they relate to global value chains. So thank you again, um, yeah, back to you. Thank you very much, Edel. That was fantastic. And I didn't realize that the book is coming out uh, in the next few days. So the timing of the panel could not be uh, better. And thank you for sharing these highlights of what is a very, very rich uh, set of analysis. So with that, I would like to now turn next to Professor Chen. Can you hear me now? Yes, okay. we can, thank uh, you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I will just follow up Etio's uh, a very, very nice uh, presentation of the general picture. Uh, if you ask multinational companies in China whether they are going to leave China because of this geopolitic thing, uh, the general answer is no. Because China is a very important market Nobody can afford to abandon the market altogether. So the production in China will certainly continue. So the so-called in China for China policy uh, will be the, the important policy. And this will be reinforced by the Chinese own policy of, of uh, so-called emphasizing internal demand uh, as an engine for future economic growth rather than exporting. And China also have uh, a very strong policies to encourage uh, foreign company, multinational company to produce in China. Uh, just take Tesla as a very good example. Uh, so this, this is going to be uh, something, if we define decoupling as whether you are going to leave China uh, you know, behind, uh, the answer is generally no. Uh, but however, I think decoupling is happening uh, in other parts of the production. For example, for Taiwanese companies, 
uh, we are uh, making goods uh, for American firms and for European firms. Uh, you know, we are under a very big pressure uh, for uh, solar decouple uh, or changing the production uh, solar configuration uh, regarding China. Uh, for example, you are working, you are making uh, uh, t-shirts or, or, or shoes for Nike. Uh, Nike will tell you not to produce it in China anymore. Or, you know, the, the things that will remain produced in China be only the Nike shoes, which are, you know, to be, to be sold for to Chinese consumers. You know, all the other production should be outside of China now. Uh, so therefore that our company uh, many years ago, in before 2018, when this trade war began, they already uh, relocating uh, production to Southeast Asia or, or Southern Asia. But remember that this Asian supply chain is so much integrated, uh, closely linked so when Taiwanese company relocate to Southeast Asia, for example, Vietnam, they continue to, to source uh, upstream product from China because China has such a huge production capacity, you know, in every industry, every segment of the industry. Uh, so when you ship the downstream production to Southeast Asia, uh, you know, you cannot help continuing to import uh, goods from the uh, from the Chinese factories. So therefore the Asia remain kind of connected. It's only a shift you know of this production. Uh, so I think the future first of all they make another example for example the, the in the IT industry such as computers uh, and, and, and phones, cell phones. Uh, notebook computer and cell phones are not yet subject to US punitive tariff. Uh, so, you know, majority remain produced in China now, uh, but they are already shifting, uh, partially shifting uh, those production which are not serving the Chinese market, particularly those are serving the US market uh, to other countries. Uh, for those IT products that are already subject to 301 tariffs, such as servers, uh, some telecommunication product, they are already uh, left China because nobody can afford to pay 25% extra tariff uh, to serve the US market. So those products were already uh, relocated. Uh, I think mostly back to, for the Taiwanese company, mostly back to the, the, uh, the Taiwanese factories. So that's the reason that our export to US in particular last year have increased so much uh, because of these so-called reshoring, re uh, so to speak. It's not reshoring to the US, but reshoring back to Taiwan. Uh, and of course that uh, the supply chain, I think some of things are just happening underneath the water. So you, you need to be, uh, you know, look at it. the Chinese government will show you a lot of statistics uh, to, to demonstrate that multinational company remain uh, very strong in China, foreign investment is still increasing and the production has never declined. Uh, but underneath that, there, there's a lot of big shifting uh, of the structure. For example, production of automobiles in China has increased, uh, particularly EV, electric uh, vehicles. Uh, and therefore you see a lot of foreign investment, uh, supply chain is actually uh, uh, kind of reinforced in China. Uh, but on the other hand, if you are looking at the uh, automobiles or, or auto parts uh, uh, that are uh, produced to serve the U.S. and European market, you know, and they're mostly are leaving China uh, because this the geopolitic uh, reach is so much uh, to fill for all the multinational firms. Okay, I will just stop there to sort of give a general picture or what been happening uh, since roughly 2018. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And I think those remarks really captured how much the terrain is shifting and how some of the responses are not what we anticipated necessarily. I mean, when we talk about reshoring, the US hopes of bringing back that capacity might not materialize, but actually it makes sense to go elsewhere in Asia, be it Taiwan or other locations. Uh, with that, I would like to then ask uh, Chris, Professor Christine Vacassi to offer her remarks. Great, thank you so much. And thanks for inviting me to speak tonight. And my, my remarks are going to um, talk about, largely about Japan and China. And this is an interesting case because somewhat like Taiwan, Japan has experienced a lot of geopolitical risk in the Japanese market. And some of the cases I think are instructive for how we can think about uh, supply chain resilience and firm level and state level responses to uh, geopolitical risks and supply chains. So I think there's two things to think about here. And one is of course, identifying points, um, like choke points or points of vulnerability. Um, and those might, of course, come from a control of a resource or some sort of technological or manufacturing expertise uh, that gives um, control over, over a particular product to a country. But then there's also particular times of vulnerability. And thinking about timing, I think, is very important because just because you are dependent does not mean you are vulnerable. It does not mean that that will be right weaponized or become a point of geopolitical risk. And when we think about responses, we need to take into account both the vulnerability and the timing because multinational firms often do not, do not choose to respond to what are perceived as political risks by political or risks by political elites. They would rather usually stay the course as um, Professor Solingen's comments are pointed to. So as, as we, we know with this China plus one strategy to diversify throughout Southeast Asia, this has been something that the Japanese government has been pushing for almost two decades now. And they first started right soon after China joined the WTO worried about Japan, Japan's growing de economic dependence on China. It was pushed through the Japan External Trade Organization, JETRO, um, as well as informally by the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry. But initially there was very little interest in diversification. If anything, when faced with political risks like that, like a big uh, anti-Japanese uh, movement in 2005, and then another political shock in 2010, if anything, move, there was more movement towards China, right? And rather, rather than any move towards diversification um, in, most, in most sectors um, or, or decoupling or anything else. However, and, and this is despite that firm said they were going to relocate. So you saw concerns stated, but you didn't see movements. In 2012, we started to see a little bit more movement um, from Japanese firms. And th so these, these data, this chart here shows um, movements from of new Japanese subsidiaries moving to these plus one countries. And you can see particularly in the right hand graph that the firms going to the plus one countries do start to overtake new firms in China, which decline as a percentage of the whole, all the numbers do go up. Um, but you can also see that this is a continuation of a trend that had happened before. So what should we take from this is that these, these political moments can spur the private sector to change behavior, but we should not necessarily expect them to be uh, proactive, but rather it often is reactive in terms of building, building supply chain resilience. Looking at a specific case is helpful of supply chain shock and a perceived geopolitical risk is really instructive of how uh, Japanese firms and the Japanese state work together to do this. And I'll talk a little bit about rare earth metals and the rare earth metal supply uh, shock that happened in 2010 when amidst a political dispute amongst the disputed uh, Senkaku or Diaoyu Islands, uh, J Japanese firms reported that they were unable to import rare earth metals from China. And following this, there was a broad response from the Japanese state as well as Japanese companies to diversify the supply chain. Reshoring here is not an option as Japan does not have a domestic source of rare earth metals. But there were all different arms of the Japanese government work together as well as the private sector in order to build a more resilient um, and less vulnerable supply chain. So there was support from the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry through subsidiary, uh, sorry, subsidies through to Japanese uh, firms that were seeking additional diversified sources of rare earth metals as well as substitutions. There was also movement from JOGMAC, 
the Japan Oil, Gas and Metals National Corporation, that as you can see, those are the triangles on the map. All around the world, Jogmec started pursuing projects. They were not all successful. Many of these projects have not come to fruition, um, but they started pursuing new investments and mining projects around the world to try and secure new sources. They did this in some of the successful cases in partnership with the Japanese private sector. And again, those faced a lot, a lot of um, hurdles that I'd be, I'd be happy to talk about more, more in the Q&A. We also see that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs started taking diplomatic trips, often with private firms to countries around the world to try and open up new supply chains. So we see the economic arm, the diplomatic arm, as well as the private sector working together to try and build a more resilient supply chain after vulnerabilities were revealed. Now this, this strategy was largely successful and Japan went from having about 90% of their rare earths coming from China to now it's, be, it's between 40 and 40 and 50, sometimes some months it's a little higher than that, but on average coming from China. On the bottom graph there, you can see that um, the United States uh, trade patterns with China largely is with rare earth metals largely have not changed. So what do we take from this? How did this work? So I think there's two main points. First is that you need to have some sort of motivation beyond the economic fundamentals. So in order for firms to choose to right, do these decoupling or reshoring or even just build it, building a diversified resilient supply chain. Choke points are there for a reason. Uh, that's usually because they're very profitable and it's, a, it's the easiest and best way to do business. Um, right, made in China for China, absolutely. But also right, buy your rare earths in China because that is where they are the least expensive and they have a lot of expertise. And so there needs to be something. So sometimes geopolitical risk can lead to these reactive successful strategies, but they also are places that introduce um, new risks. And that's a place that you can have state support at critical junctures that may help build those resilient supply chains. I think that's more difficult to do in a proactive way rather than a reactive way, because often there, there, there is more reluctance on the part of the private sector to diversify or take these strategies than states might seem, might, might assume. Today, we see in, from in Japan similar responses as we saw in the rare earth case happening post-pandemic. And we see that through state actions from METI. Um, we see that in a um, Japan reaching out to partners in Southeast Asia, as well as the United States to build more multinational resilient supply chains. And I think there's a lot of lessons we can learn. So I'll wrap up there and I, I look forward to our conversation. Thank you very much. That was uh, really great. And I enjoyed very much uh, the graphics. I think that they were very effective in uh, making the points uh, that you were referring to, um, uh, Christine. And in particular, I enjoyed very much the point you made that choke points are there for a reason, the efficiency, the gravity, the, the sense of uh, uh, the weight that gra efficiency consideration has. And therefore, you need uh, some kind of geopolitical shift to justify moving into a new uh, pattern of uh, production or integration. So, um, you know, uh, all the panelists have been very disciplined and they presented a lot in, the, in a very concise way. So I think that that leaves us with a lot of time for a discussion and I would like to start um, uh, that. And, uh, you know, I think that um, sometimes we uh, focus very much on the current moment on the headlines and feel that indeed bright new world is or bright dark world is opening in front of us. But I think that uh, you'll have a uh, long expertise on the operation of these supply uh, networks. And you know it's par for the course that if you're going to be operating a production network across national borders, political risks and other types of risks are embedded in that uh, uh, proposition. So um, you know these uh, uh, global value chains are no strangers to the management of different types of risks and supply shocks. And, um, you know, Kristen made reference to one when she was talking about the, um, the van that uh, China imposed on the export of rare earth metals to Japan in 2010. But there have been other examples. I'm also thinking mostly of the Japanese case, but others can bring others. Uh, thinking of the Great Eastern uh, earthquake in Japan, the Tohoku earthquake and how that damaged um, production networks. So I was wondering if we look back 
and um, think about supply shocks, think about the uh, exposure to some of these uh, choke points, what lessons can be drawn about how firms adjust to these disruptions? Because my concern is that lately we just think about vulnerabilities and risks without really fully um, realizing or articulating that supply chains are also a mechanism of insurance. They provide a hedging option. If you tap on the trade channel, you can uh, uh, access uh, uh, components, you can rely on firms within the network, and that is also a source of resilience. So uh, again, it's not just about the risks, but also the uh, benefits uh, that comes from a supply chain network. So what can we learn from previous supply shocks? I can start with. Go ahead, Ethel, thank you. Yeah. So I think the main lessons from uh, natural disasters, which you mentioned, geopolitical and pandemic risks, uh, take us back to where we, where I started out, you know, diversification, some relaxation of just-in-time or hyper-efficiency, more robust inventories, mapping, all tiers, transparency, all of those things, digitalization. But from the perspective of international relations, the lesson is simply there is no alternative to multilateral rule-based solutions. Coercive economic statecraft may be sometimes necessary, but also has a checkered record in our field, as you know. Uh, there are blowback and spillback effects that sometimes hurt the sender no less than the target. So, and of course, all countries shoot themselves in the foot occasionally, some more than others. But the case of rare earths that um, uh, Professor Vicese discussed is a, is a good one because it is one thing to move up the to want to move up the value chain in, in rare earth and quite another to curtail supplies to others, right? Which China has done uh, for over a decade now, beginning, <clears throat> excuse me, beginning with that Senkaku DOU um, events uh, after 2020, 2010. So what happened is that uh, Australia, Brazil, Vietnam, Mongolia and the US also have significant reserves. And the map that uh, Professor Rikesi showed, right, showed some alternatives, right? Uh, other viable alternatives to rare airs, maybe in the offing, not today, but um, uh, China also understanding some of this raised its production quotas slightly as a bargaining chip, uh, but the executive order uh, is explicit on targeting rare earths for a reason. You know, they've been used in the past. And even European allies are, that are not thrilled with the coupling, okay? They have incentives to diminish the vulnerability of supply chains in critical raw materials. So those are some of the lessons. But as to your other question, Mireille, I think you said something about uh, what do we stand to lose if economic nationalism prevails? Is that, mm -hmm. um, I think we may end up very briefly exactly uh, if, if economic nationalism does prevail, we may end up exactly with what protectionism portends to minimize the loss of good jobs. And other effects would be, you know, higher costs for consumers, potentially higher inflation at a time when we know that some inflation is expected perhaps, lower R&D investments by firms, lower productivity, lower competitiveness and growth, and the potential replacement of US firms by others that are not interested in decoupling. So uh, one last issue on, on one last warning about these lessons is that a recent IMF study by Cerdero et al estimated that trade tensions between the US and China have cost about half of a percent of GDP globally, but that tech decoupling, including by Europe, could raise the cost tenfold mm -hmm. and up to 5% of GDP. So, um, and, 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 you know, doing away with more connectivity, uh, according to another study by the OECD, 
uh, could not just reduce GDP and incomes, but also become more, not less vulnerable to shocks. I'll stop there. That, that was fascinating. Thank you so much, Ethel. Other uh, comments from the panelists? Uh, go ahead, Professor Chen. Yes, I, I will just follow up by saying that supply chain management is a long history and a multinational firm, you know, they have learned to deal with this for a long time, uh, such as natural disaster and social unrest and the others. Uh, but this, this political risk, this geopolitics politics, getting into the supply chain management is something very, very new. Uh, and so a big challenge for uh, particularly smaller multinationals or suppliers which are not so familiar with international politics. Uh, for example, our Taiwanese company, they never, you know, they, they always believe that stay away from politics is the best way to do business. Uh, but now the whole picture is different. If you don't pay attention to politics, you could be in trouble and you don't know how to deal with it. That's, that's the new challenge, I think, for uh, international divisional labor and, and the collaboration between uh, firm from different, different countries. Uh, for example, there was a, a, a sudden announcement by uh, US Commerce Department the other day that putting some Chinese companies on the entity list. And then immediately that, uh, you know, one of the major suppliers to those company, one of the so-called military related company in China, uh, I think the stock price will just drop down uh, <laughs> for three, four days consecutively. This is something very, very difficult. Uh, so I guess the, the, the really a need for uh, uh, government of different countries to have more coordination uh, in exercising this kind of management uh, whenever this politics is involved. Uh, some of the issues we are discussing uh, regarding the supply chain uh, security is really uh, responsibility of the government, uh, not the companies. Uh, but we are now asking the companies to, to, to bear this responsibility, which is, I think is very, very difficult. Uh, for example, you are talking about the, the, the risk of losing a supply of active medicine from China and therefore jeopardizing your pharmaceutical industry, such as what's been happening in India right now. Uh, this, I believe, is something need to be carefully uh, uh, thought out, uh, and the government has to play some role in that process uh, instead of, uh, you know, try to kind of reconfigure uh, the global production as the sole solution uh, to, to sort of uh, uh, make sure that, uh, you know, security in the supply chain is maintained. Uh, so there is a, a necessity for dialogue uh, between the public sector and private sector uh, as far as this uh, uh, so-called resilient uh, supply chain uh, is concerned. You know, I think we do make a big mistake by putting too much production in China uh, because for the reason of efficiency, you know, because this is such an efficient production you put everything in there and it's one country, you can source everything. And then, uh, you know, almost every industry is available, all kinds of materials are available. And they, uh, with the government subsidy and the other things, it's so cheap, uh, so convenient to do it. You know, just look what iPhone being produced. Uh, so we do need to make adjustment to that. Uh, I think we need to diversify away from concentration in China. Uh, but we, you know, in order to rebuild uh, a supply chain uh, without China and as efficient as the one that with China would take some time and, and we need sort of call the uh, coordination uh, between, between countries. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, you know, um, going along uh, with this uh, conversation, um, you know, I think that some of the lessons that to me are, uh, are striking is one that, you know, reshoring full set production in one country is not necessarily equivalent to uh, uh, secure uh, supply of, product, of products and uh, secure production uh, capabilities. It seems that, you know, diversification uh, uh, is better because again, uh, what we've seen from uh, firms that are affected by natural disasters or by uh, interstate tensions is that frequently tapping on the network makes them more resilient. So again, putting all your eggs in one basket does not necessarily call for a good recipe. But also I think that a, another lesson is that it is true that uh, choke points can be manipulated by states. They can try to weaponize interdependence and there's a flourishing uh, literature on that, but it's not a cost-free option. I would make the, the case that if you decide to exercise the card, you should be prepared to perhaps lose influence because supply chains are not going to stay still if a strategic vulnerability has been exposed. Now, the, uh, the success of the adjustment uh, remains to be seen, but we can you know, go by the case of the rare earth metals in Japan, but also the more recent uh, Japan-Korea uh, dispute on export uh, controls. And what ends up happening is that when firms and governments on the receiving end find themselves uh, pushed against the corner, they feel that they, they uh, have to quickly develop alternative suppliers, develop domestic productive capacities. It is the firms, uh, uh, the other firms that were supplying that market that are at the risk of losing uh, those clients. So I think that that's also an important um, element to take into account. And I also believe that when we talk about supply chains, um, it really depends on what kind of product we're talking about, because some are more strategic than others. And um, I have a two part question. Uh, one is I would like to ask uh, Christine to tease out more because she told us that she could tell us more about uh, successes and failures of the uh, Japanese program to diversify and develop alternative sources of rare earth metals. Um, I think this is a very important topic because the United States today is attempting to do the same and Japan appears as a model, even though we do not have the same machinery of government uh, institutions being able to provide the kind of financing that's available uh, in Japan. So what could be learned uh, from that? But after hearing from Kristin on that specific point, I would also like to ask panelists if they feel inclined to discuss semiconductors. Because if we think about choke points, that's another one that stands out. And it's really striking that when you talk about really advanced chip manufacture, you're talking about choke points, you're talking about concentration. There are very few uh, firms that are the leading actors. There are very few countries that are producing the bulk, the vast majority of these uh, chips. They're located in East Asia in hotspots. I'm talking about uh, Taiwan and South Korea. And uh, therefore, this creates a whole debate as to where those are vulnerabilities that should be addressed in the manner in which I've been describing. So I put on the table a lot, but if we think about the strategic commodities, choke points, rare earth metals, and semiconductors, what's the state of play and what can uh, governments and firms do to uh, reduce uh, vulnerabilities? So Christine, why don't we start with you and then we can um, continue with the other panelists if they feel so inclined. Absolutely, yeah. Thanks for that question. Um, and I, so, so when when Japan first started off trying to diversify rare earth metals, there were you know there's these many policies and and Jogmec went out and started to do these things. And one of the early uh, successes was with this Australian firm named Linus. And Linus is also a firm that the United States is working with to try and diversify rare earth metals. So that's um, that's uh, it's a it's a key firm, a key non Chinese firm that has a lot of experience. However, around 2010, Linus was in a lot of trouble and was starting to go bankrupt. And so the Japanese uh, trade, general trading company, Sojitsu, and Linus work together to um, save, to sort of pull Linus out and to and to reinvest in the mines. And then, so, and then Linus later also began to go bankrupt again. And so one of the things in the rare earth metal uh, market is that 
China does have a lot of uh, control over the production mm -hmm. and can to some extent uh, change the price. Um, not completely, right? It's, you know, there's a global market. And so when the prices, the prices go way up at, in 2010 and then they crash after the, you know, the, the geopolitical crisis ends and people stop panicking. And that means all of these new mines that had been opened started to close. And so this initial diversification push failed because of really normal market mechanisms that they, they no longer could afford, afford to run. And so Jogmak, the Japanese state and Sojitsu needed to bail out Linus a number of times and they did, they, they did. And so that at that critical juncture where, where Japan could have said, okay, well, you know, it's gone back to normal with, with China, let's just, let's just give up. They decided to stay the course. And, and, and so today there, there are still some issues. They have a processing plant in Malaysia. It's a very high polluting process. There are difficulties in the Malaysian market with, with that process, but the metals are mined in Australia. They're shipped to Malaysia for processing and then they're sold um, to Japan and they're mostly turned into electric car batteries. And there, has been, there have been multiple investments and sort of reassessments of both business risk and political risk. And so I, the reason I think that's so, so important to, to, think, to think through is that the, the ventures that this, particularly that the state might do often will fail. And so if, if it's a key, if it's a key part of a national strategy, securing uh, critical materials, then th there will be, <laughs> there will be many times that, that don't work out the way that the, the investors initially, initially thought. Um, currently the Department of Defense is investing in a Linus processing plant in Texas. And that is, that's a, a, a component of the, of the um, strategy. And it, we, we don't know what will happen, but this is, it's been years in the making and it, ha it hasn't started to um, supply the United States market yet. And it still may take a long, a long time. Um, to, to pivot slightly so that the Japan and then maybe go into this next part of the question. Um, I think the Japan South Korea semiconductor or, or the, the support the um, materials that are used in semiconductors is also a great example of how um, this, these choke points can be maybe wasted if used for economic coercion. You know, once you, once you let that arrow fly from the quiver, you do not get it back. And the South Korea has not managed to replicate uh, the photoresist, I believe at the purity and quantity that they need from Japan. But once, once the private sector and state were well aware of that vulnerability to Japan and that Japan might be willing to right, loose the arrow, then, then it's the Japanese suppliers that are, that are really at, you know, facing business risks of losing their customers. Thank you, uh, great, great discussion. So um, uh, then let us pivot to semiconductors. Um, and if there are any comments on, on that, um, uh, you know, I think that there have been a lot of developments uh, that's at the center of the US-China tech competition. Uh, Professor Chen mentioned the entity list and how that has been uh, applied more strictly. Uh, you know, it was not just American companies, but later on this was also uh, applied to foreign companies that used American technology and machinery that they also need to abide by the entity list. And I think it, uh, this whole episode did underscore what is a key vulnerability of China, and that is that it does not really yet produce the most advanced um, semiconductors. And I think this only redoubled the Chinese intent to uh, become self-reliant. And it's a question as to how fast can it do it, but it also put um, you know, Taiwanese and South Korean and uh, Japanese firms who are part of that supply chain in a difficult uh, position because they must navigate this uncertainty. The rules of the road are now being changed uh, um, frequently. And it also, we're seeing moves from the United States government to try to bring some of that advanced manufacturing capacity to the United States with you know, uh, plans to invest say in Arizona and so forth. So um, you know, some analysts have said that in the future, uh, when we look at supply chains, that's where the real uh, um, risk of fragmentation exists. I think that Paul Triolo in a, in a report uh, that uh, he published that he co-authored talks about 
um, red supply chains and blue supply chains. And then, you know, we talk about resilience, maybe we're going to talk about redundancy in the sense that you're going to have to be targeting different uh, customers, or it might not be possible to serve both markets. So how does this uh, uh, picture look for you if you're looking at the semiconductor industry? I will say, um, the, well, this become a very hot uh, topic now. The, the concentration of semiconductor production in uh, three countries, of East Asia, Taiwan, Korea, and Japan. But altogether, I think these three countries account for 60, 60 some percent of the global production of semiconductor. These, I think there are two reasons for that we have to, to keep in mind. One is, of course, the scale economies, right? Uh, as the technology advances, you are uh, making semiconductor conductors with uh, thinner and thinner solar line uh, width. Uh, the scale economy will increase, uh, so you need a huge investment, uh, a lot of uh, production with different kind of product putting together in order to support a semiconductor fab. Okay, if you do not have such huge production uh, output, you just cannot have uh, economical uh, production here. So that's one thing, they, they, they have to be concentrated in, uh, in, in only a few places. Secondary, uh, they also, uh, we have to keep in mind the production of semiconductor is particularly harsh. Uh, the, this, the fab operate 24 hours a day you cannot afford to shut it down. Uh, so therefore the engineers, you, you need to have the kind of labor, uh, kind of working ethic that engineers which, who are paid very well, of course. However, they are very uh, precious brand. Uh, they can be used in other industries. Uh, those people, they have to take terms to work in the factory, in the fab for 24 hours. And they are like medical doctors, they are on call, even if they are home. Uh, so this is not an industry that every country would like to have. You know, it, it's very hard to have this kind of uh, industry uh, in other countries. You, if you have a very uh, a liberal, so-called liberal labor law, uh, so, 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 so really that this, the reason why the production has continued to shift to East Asia, uh, because of these, I think the, the working ethics of the engineer, uh, and of course now it's too much concentrated. We also worry, for example, in Taiwan, we produce so much, uh, and then we are now short of labor. We are short of engineers. We are short of water. Uh, so this thing cannot continue. Uh, we are already reach uh, a sort of limit of the natural resources supply. So they, they need to be diversified. So there is an incentive even on the side of the, uh, of the company to diversify somewhere else. Uh, but as I say that you need conditions, uh, you know, you need first a big demand in order to supply to support this scale uh, of production, uh, so that you need a big market to do that, and second, you need to have engineers who are good enough, who are disciplined, and then are willing to suffer. Uh, so there are, I think, there are only a few places you can do this, uh, but I think that will happen. Now back to China, because of this polit political uh, confrontation and the choke point, so-called, uh, China, of course, is very determined now to, to, to build its own semiconductor industry at any cost. Uh, so this is going to happen uh, sooner or later. Uh, they already have uh, a kind of reasonable technology uh, to, to begin with. And, and, and I think for their purposes, uh, I think they, they, they were certainly, this is the project uh, is worth the money. So this will continue to drive the so-called decoupling uh, because of the, uh, the motivation 
uh, for self-reliance. Okay. And that, of course, also put the pressure on, uh, on Taiwanese companies, you know, because China is also a big market for us. Uh, so, you know, if allowed, uh, if not for the concern of national security, we certainly would like to serve those customers, that's number one. Second, uh, you know, China has all kinds of tools uh, <laughs> to get our people away from Taiwan. Work in China, they pay them uh, several times of salary. Uh, they can get technologies one way or the other. Uh, so th this is a tremendous uh, pressure uh, from both ends of these uh, two big superpower in the world. So very hard to deal with, but this is something uh, you know, we have to confront uh, in the future. There, there's just no way out. There, there will not be a compromise. I cannot think of anything that will uh, stop China uh, from pursuing uh, the objective of self-reliance. And I will not, you know, I have not had an idea that U.S. will stop, uh, uh, you know, uh, cutting this supply off from China. Uh, because the purpose of the two countries are exactly the same. Uh, so, yeah, this is something that we really need to think about. And, and a lot of coordination, as I said, uh, is needed. For example, there's a recent shortage of the automobile semiconductor chips, you know. That is something that is not, there never been a major product of, of our industry here in Taiwan, okay. But suddenly the world is in short of this supply and if everyone was looking to Taiwan, so why don't you uh, sort of, uh, you know, wrap up the production. So we need, we really need to work together. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. A really fascinating mm -hmm. discussion. Um, I'm enjoying it very much, but I also now need to bring the questions from the audience and there's a uh, very large number of really excellent questions. So I probably will not do justice to all of them, but I would just want to start and, uh, I want to use this image uh, from Kristen, uh, Kristen about, you know, um, the arrows in your quiver and, uh, you know, geopolitical uh, competition. Um, this is a question from my uh, colleague, M Michael O'Hanlon, and the question is, what is the most important vulnerability democracies should mitigate in order to be able to withstand any Chinese economic warfare or embargo in the context of a future security crisis in Asia. So um, if there is indeed a security crisis in Asia and uh, China is willing to use some of these arrows and you know, apply pressure on choke points, what should we be concerned the most with? And then second, can democracies pull together? Uh, because that's a really a very important premise of the Biden administration foreign policy that one way in which we create resilience is by coordinating strongly among like-minded democracies. So how would this be operationalized? I think that we already highlighted that some Asian democracies also have frictions amongst each other, but also if they, even if they're fully aligned and they share threat perception and they share political willingness to coordinate, what are the steps to actually be able to do this in real time in concrete industries? So I can address the second part on a few thoughts on um, what do we do with allies, right? Especially because the Biden administration is placing quite a bit of emphasis on, on, on that strategy. So I think, first of all, it's important to de-escalate from too broad a scope for identifying those risks in supply chains, right? And that means not stretching legitimate concerns with national security and dual use uh, to, encompassing, to encompass much less sensitive domains where cooperation and interdependence make more sense. And I think most allies would welcome that. Uh, strengthening trusted supplier networks with democracies, for instance, with, with our allies that are mostly democracies, seems reasonable in principle, but too broad a definition to return to the point, too broad a definition of what's risky 
will most certainly backfire in my view. And indeed, some key allies are quite hesitant. Germany's foreign minister just, um, I believe a week ago, was very clear, decoupling is not the way, is the wrong way. Uh, Taiwan and South Korea, we heard uh, just now from Professor Chen, uh, don't want to lose their China market or US patents. European allies uh, from Europe to from Europe to Asia, they don't want to choose, and they are uh, basically playing both sides uh, for advantages. So, what most U.S. allies would like, um, for instance, is for the U.S. to join the uh, CPTPP and restore its commitment to freer trade, and of course, RCEP is now a fact. So, they want to delimit is what I'm trying to say, uh, the limit, the, um, the forbidden items. What do they also want? Uh, well, some are defining the Biden strategy as containment, but they, the allies would prefer, and it's probably more likely to emerge as more of a mix, uh, some congagement, if you will, some containment where China seem, you know, is, has been more hostile and continued engagement in areas where China's leadership seems more reasonable. And not just the environment and nuclear proliferation, but con engagement will require mutual transparency, humility regarding each other's liabilities and building trust. And the, the GVC issue, um, should be nested in this accommodating framework. And by the way, engagement is not a new thing. The mix has been there in some ways since China opened up. It's the dance and the rhythm of engagement that is sometimes altered depending on the issues at hand. For instance, uh, again, some of China's policies in recent years, Trump's responses, and especially COVID have accelerated the rhythm so uh, we need to be very careful on those, uh, to make those good decisions, especially regarding GVCs that require slowing down the populist frenzy on all sides. With respect, maybe a word if I have, um, if I have uh, one second, uh, a word on, on the military related risks. The bottom line I think is the trick it, with respect to high tech concerns will be to find that balance, you know, a way to minimize the minimax, right? To minimize the worst risks to US security and maximize the benefit, the benefits of continued global deployment of US tech. Um, and I'll stop there. Could I just add a, a, a tiny a comment to that? Is I absolutely agree that so it's 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 difficult to say. Well, what will the what will the sector be that's the most risky? And we we don't know. And one of and and may, maybe somebody has the right guess out there. But that every sector is so specific. The nature of the engineers, the the magnetism of the metals, right? These these very very sector specific things are going to become important. Right, the the quality of the face mask, and that that I absolutely agree that building strong inst institutions, um, perhaps amongst democracies, and being able to have coordination to solve those very very sector specific problems is what would would help. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much. So then let me, um, you know, put together two questions um, that look at the element of uh, reshoring. And uh, one question was about Taiwan's reshoring uh, program. The other question was about uh, Japan's uh, reshoring uh, South City. So uh, let me then combine them so we can have a discussion as to whether it makes sense to hedge on the margin by subsidizing uh, firms uh, 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 reshoring activities. So the first one comes from uh, Dennis McNamara, who is a professor at Georgetown University, and it reads as follows. Cross-strait investment in the Sunan region of Jiangsu province continues to upgrade to upgrade. Taiwan's investors appear content to continue using mainland knowledge, resources, exploit market, markets, and cooperate in global value chains. 
Will President size incentives for reshoring attract them? What about for research and development? And the second question comes from Eve Thibergien, professor at UBC and distinguished fellow at the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada. And Eve asks, can the speakers evaluate the impact of the Japanese reshoring program since April uh, 2020? I think it's not $3.1 billion that have been committed to this. Uh, some have argued that Japanese firms have used the public money to reshore product lines that were not competitive in China while still increasing investment in China in more competitive products. Is that true? So are these subsidies good idea or are they uh, really just, you know, uh, companies uh, making use of them in a difficult time, but again, not to the best uh, 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 outcome or the most efficient uh, outcome. So uh, it's notable that there are these programs. The US actually is now considering uh, uh, also providing support for reshoring some production. Should the state be in the business of facilitating uh, that private activity or not? Yeah, I think I will take the uh, Taiwan's, uh, the question on our Taiwanese firms in China and reshoring. The, the government subsidy is really minimal. I think the, they only have marginal effect on, uh, you know, uh, business decisions uh, as to whether to come back to Taiwan or not. It's the trade war uh, U.S.-China trade war that play the majority, you know, the most important role of uh, uh, reallocating their production uh, in, you know, uh, in China and outside of China. Uh, I think China now is already, you know, 40 years after this uh, open and reform, reform and opening uh, has a reach a point that uh, you know, we should say that in economics, that the surface labor is no longer there. It's a high cost production uh, process already. Uh, if we look into the future that in order to uh, conform to their commitment of carbon neutrality by 2060, uh, a lot of production have to be stopped in China. So they are also under uh, immense uh, pressure for restructuring the industry. And of course, Taiwanese company in China is one of the forces uh, they are uh, leveraged to uh, upgrade the industry. Uh, and they also incentive also from the Taiwanese company side to uh, continue to develop in China because they are very much rooted uh, so much uh, 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 connected with the local industry. So I'm talking about, I don't, I don't know the percentage, but there's a certain percent, percentage of the Taiwanese companies now in China who are producing something to be used in China rather than for exporting. Uh, and those are the forces. I think the Chinese government, government uh, is, uh, is targeting with different kind of incentive to help them uh, localized using more local resources, uh, upgrade their technology. Uh, and of course, uh, from economic perspective, this is not too bad uh, because we do need uh, uh, some of Chinese resources to continue to grow. On the other hand, this is not too bad from the political point of view either. Uh, because maintaining a good economic so-called mutual benefit uh, between China and Taiwan is, is good for stabilizing uh, the cross-trade relationship. Uh, so a lot of we are supporting, you know, uh, the U.S. initiative of, uh, you know, so-called resilient supply chain things, but, uh, you know, for our uh, own sort of from our own perspective is also very important, important to minimize the tension uh, you know, across the strait. And, and then this economic so-called benefit it, to the extent which is, does not jeopardize in uh, the national security uh, is something good. Uh, so this, this is a certain uh, compromise there. Uh, so I think, uh, uh, plus, I think I just mentioned before that the Chinese policy 
is to increase in their dependence on the domestic consumption rather than export also. So the kind of, they're, they're moving toward kind of more in, inward looking uh, internal demand as a driving force for future economic growth. And, and, and so that, that is something I think is pretty much consistent with, with what the US government is wanting. Uh, so the both sides is reinforcing each other. So it's going to see a big restructuring uh, of the production uh, uh, in, in East Asia. Thank you. Very interesting. Any, any other comments? I'll just I'll just say quite quickly that I'm I'm in general skeptical of reshoring subsidies that bring companies back to the country their country of origin that they might have left. Um, they often did leave for strong efficiency reasons, and the inefficiencies they that may have existed in the home market will still be there. And I, I don't want to speak to whether these particular companies are doing things. We don't know yet. We'll have to we'll have to wait a year or two and find out what the what the results are. Um, but in terms of th there, there have also been subsidies that and and I, I I'm a little bit more optimistic and I think that there is a public policy case to be made for helping country uh, companies diversify internationally, particularly if they're entering new markets that they may not have um, a lot of knowledge about particularly if they are smaller companies, that many of these you know, 10,000 plus Japanese firms in China, they have, a, they have their headquarters in Japan and then one small subsidiary in China. They're not large multinational firms you know, with thousands of employees and et, et cetera. So in, in that case, there might be a case to be made that that will help the overall resilience and some will fail. But even though some fail, I think there is a public policy case to be made that there that that could ease supply shocks of, um, say, medical supplies or critical materials or, or other things. Thank you very much, and I think that leads to what will probably be the last question for uh, this evening. And um, some of you have already touched on this, but I would like to bring it in case anybody would like to add something because. This is really the question of what to do next. What are the best practices? This question comes from Saori Katada of the University of Southern California. And she asks, what is the most effective method for governments which worry about supply chain resilience as a part of country's economic security to increase supply chain resilience and incentivize private sectors, private sector to hedge risks? So, you know, it's a risky world, <laughs> increasingly so, uncertainties rising. Um, what are the best practices out there to manage this in a way in which we do not kill economic uh, drive, innovation, openness, and hedge against risks? Any uh, words for wisdom on this? I'll start off and just say that the, I, it's really in the details. And I applaud governments that are doing deep studies of where there may be risks and really looking very specifically sector by sector and, and focusing in there rather than taking a very broad brush to say trade with China. Mm -hmm. that's, that's not helpful. And it's, it's, it need, you need to drill down into very much at the product level to understand what supply chain, uh, where supply chain vulnerabilities are, and then to look for allies that could help build more resilience. That strikes me as great advice. So probably um, if there are no um, uh, short interventions from any, any of the other panelists, I think that we're at the end of um, Maybe our just Sure. Ethel, please go just ahead. one endorsement of what um, Professor Vicasey just said that in that con in that context of mapping vul vulnerabilities, maybe the the Biden administration's um, effort to do just that to map uh, may be the right way to go, uh, provided the use of the you know the end results of that study are are the appropriate ones, but mapping mapping those vulnerabilities, I think, might be a very valuable exercise. Yes, I fully agree with that. Uh, thank you very much. So again, this has been a fantastic, uh, vigorous, and dynamic uh, discussion. So thank you very much for sharing your insights, and thank you everybody in the audience for joining us tonight. It has been such a pleasure. Have a good evening and good day in Taiwan, or elsewhere in Asia. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.